welcome back. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Supervisory Special Agent uh, Kathleen Cooker. Uh, uh, Ms. Cooker has been an FBI agent for 13 years um, and has uh, been uh, coordinating national activities in the area of weapons of uh, mass destruction responses and preparedness of our country uh, in that regard. She's currently working at the WMD uh, Operations Unit at FBI Headquarters, uh, where she maintains a close liaison with the bioterrorism response program we've been hearing about uh, at the CDC. Uh, we at the proposed uh, Center for Disaster Preparedness here are, are pleased to have been working with our local FBI office here in Birmingham. Uh, Agent Kukler uh, will provide insights into crisis management and response, as you heard this morning, uh, uh, where they're the lead agency and taking the vantage point of, of that agency um, that uh, represents the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Dr. Cooker. Ms. Cooker. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not quite sure how to change the program from his to mine. So if I go faster, people can uh, go to lunch earlier? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I need to start this at the beginning. Back up. OK. Which is with the arrows? Let's see if you, uh, you want to go to the prior slide, or do you want to go to the beginning? Beginning. This is. There we go, one. OK. There we go. Thank you. Again, my name is Kathleen Cooker, and uh, I also have an email address if you have any questions after this uh, that you'd like to email me. It's kcooker, that's K-K-U-K-E-R, at leo, L-E-O, dot gov. And uh, I'm going to talk about the crisis response for the federal government t today, but I'm also going to give you a little history of why the FBI is involved in response to uh, weapons of mass destruction and, and our, our, uh, our relationship with other agencies regarding the threats. This is what uh, gives us our, our jurisdiction and our uh, role in a response of PDD 39. Uh, signed in, in 1995. It outlines the responsibility of all the federal agencies involved in the U.S. government response to both domestic and international terrorism. Uh, I'd like to point out it designates the FBI as a lead federal agency for federal operational response to terrorist incidents inside the United States. This is our mission statement at the unit that I uh, work at, the Women's Ma Mass Destruction Operations Unit. We provide program management for all threats. It doesn't matter if it's a threat to a federal building or to an individual person. We handle any threat that comes to us regarding chemical, biological, nuclear, or radiological threats. We provide threat assessments and uh, guidance to a WMD response program that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But I'd like to emphasize uh, especially after the comment about pouring bleach on top of the uh, Petri dish and the B'nai B'rith incident, uh, our number one priority is to preserve life and minimize health risks. Therefore, we will not uh, save the evidence in spite of someone's health. This is our number one priority. So if the evidence gets ruined in the process, that's, that's, that's fine because uh, public health safety, as uh, Major Corpeter said, um, is number one and number two. Our priorities also are to uh, locate and rescue. Uh, we don't necessarily have to provide decontamination services because our local hazmat teams all around the country are, are uh, well um, equipped for this, and we've worked very closely with them on a number of incidents. Uh, we also work with effective release of public emergency information. Uh, you've had your uh, incident here recently where I had the pleasure of talking to Dr. Warnley. Um, 
how do you release uh, information to the media about the results, the uh, diagnosis of the anthrax threat scare that came to your city? How much information do you provide uh, to the media and, and in what uh, manner so that they can digest it and um, understand that there is, there is no threat? And of course, our, uh, after public he health and safety, I'd say our, one of our main goals is to apprehend and prosecute the perpetrators. This is uh, our main violation that we work with. Uh, unfortunately, it is uh, illegal to knowingly develop, to have the weapon, to use it as a weapon. You have to threaten to use it as a weapon. Therefore, you can have anthrax in your house. You can make ricin and have it on your kitchen counter. Right now, there is no law that says you cannot um, acquire them just to have around. And Larry Wayne Harris, we'll talk about later, is a, an example of that. So therefore, our, uh, we need to work on our uh, statutes to give us a little bit more teeth in prosecution for just uh, experimenting with an agent that the person really has no go good reason to be, have it in his possession. How do we perform our threat assessments? We don't do it alone. We do it with all the subject matter experts in the various agencies that we work with. And these are the three viewpoints that we use. Behavioral resolve, does he really have the motivation to be able to pull it off? Or is, is, it, just, is it just a child writing a letter? We bring in our uh, profilers, if it's a written letter, to go over <coughs> what the wording is. Technical feasibility, does he have the right equipment? And uh, Dr. Franz talked about dual use of equipment earlier today. And the operational practicality, the Om Shirikyo is a good example of this. They had the money, they had the technical feasibility, but they didn't have the operational practicality to pull it off successfully, at least in a mass casualty, which was the goal. This is um, a list of uh, some of the people that we participate with. We always, on our conference calls, have our hazardous material response unit. Uh, if we have a written threat or a uh, uh, recorded threat, we will have our, uh, it's a long acronym for our profilers, that second one. Then the uh, DOD assets that we most commonly uh, use is USAMRID. We, we're with them awful, uh, off often because not only for diagnostic capability, but also for papers that are issued by the National Domestic Preparedness Office in their special bulletins on advice to first responders. Other agencies, uh, most commonly there would be uh, DHHS, who we deal with almost every day on these threats. Also, we provide um, jurisdictional advice uh, legislative advice. We work very closely with uh, special prosecutors at Department of Justice on prosecuting not only federally, but if it's going to be a state prosecution. We'll be glad to offer assistance in that. Last night we talked about coordinating the response to the incident. This is another one of those charts that uh, the main thing I wanted to point out was that, make sure I don't We talked last night, uh, the FBI Joint Operations Center would have leaders from all the agencies in, the, in that command center. After the response has been initially responded to by the Unified Command and the ICS of the local police fire and hazmat. But if you'll see over here to the left, we talked about the importance of public information. All representatives from this area and all the agencies that are listed below are going to have a say in a joint press release. That's the only way to come out with a common voice to the public, but it'll be predominantly guided by your public health people because they're the ones that have the expertise in how to describe this to the public for a threat. Um, in reality though, it's really going to be, if it was a situation last night with smallpox, it's going to be the White House telling our operations center to, what to do and us working with other agencies and down the line. If it, goes, if it was uh, an intentional outbreak that was determined, such as Dr. Spiegel was talking about, some of the um, 
diseases that would come across that you would know right away are intentional would be inhalational anthrax, um, I don't know, pulmonary plague, uh, in inhalational plague, more than one or two at a time, smallpox, a genetically engineered organism, immediately would uh, draw attention to the fact that it, it has to be intentional. There would be no reason why it would happen naturally. But this would be handled at the public health level at first with CDC to determine that before anybody higher up would make a decision um, to announce to the public that there was a threat. We're only as good as our subject matter experts. I would like to talk about our Hazardous Materials Response Unit. Uh, they are located at Quantico. Um, I'm happy to say that, uh, like you, SAMR, they're not uh, needed as much lately because of the initiative by CDC with the local laboratories. Uh, they used to fly out quite often to pick up unknown materials around the country, uh, but now because of the protocols established with the local labs, uh, the, the, um, this past, uh, since January 2000, we've had over 57 uh, biological threats, and uh, 40 of them happened in two weeks, and they were all handled by local labs. And the year before, when we had this, uh, an, a similar outbreak, a lot of them very many of them were flown to USAMRID. Our uh, Hazardous Materials Resp Response Unit is made up of FBI supervisory special agents, uh, hazardous materials technicians and specialists, and scientists. Some of them are agents with scientific degrees. Their uh, hazmat capabilities are uh, level A to, through D. Um, but uh, I'd like to point out again, decontamination, they haven't had uh, to use that much because of local hazmat teams. Basically, they're just called in when it's uh, unknown biological that a ha hazmat team is uh, maybe by OSHA regulations or whatever, it's just not going to uh, re handle a biological. Another one of our programs is the 56 field offices, every single one of them has a weapons of mass destruction coordinator. Here in, Al in Birmingham, Alabama, we have Larry Strayer, and their job is to coordinate with the four disciplines of fire, hazmat, law enforcement, and public health. Uh, three years ago, I'm sure a lot of you would not have known an FBI agent to talk to concerning these matters, and vice versa for us. It's, uh, it's a program that's worked very well for us. And uh, we also have 400 resident agencies throughout the United States. They are smaller offices, anywhere from one man to 20-man uh, offices. How many residence agencies do we have? In, we have four in the state of Alabama. This is another uh, threat spectrum, much like uh, Major cor Corporator's one, and that is the easier they are to procure or make creates a higher incident of hoaxes, such as ricin up here. It's easier to get a hold of industrial chemicals, radioisotopes, and biological path pathogens. Although a nuclear weapon is going to have the highest incident, it's going to be the lowest threat because of how difficult it is to do. And this is where our experience is mostly in these uh, four up here. The, the common threats um, that we receive are anthrax and ricin and the radiological materials most commonly. The agents that have actually been used have been these on this side. Uh, luckily, you can see no one's mentioned uh, smallpox. We're very happy about that. We have recently had a, a bomb thrown into a restaurant that had a pesticide attached to it, which uh, was responded to by first responders without respiratory apparatus, so uh, we're hoping to be able to put this person away. We've had some conversation about the spectrum of the terrorist. Our, uh, ex our experience here in the United States are with lone individuals, Timothy McVeigh's, you know, people that are, are anti-abortion, 
whereas when you're talking about state-sponsored groups, that is where the ability is going to lie for your uh, infectious diseases that are harder to work with, such as smallpox, et cetera. And, but this is the most, the, uh, what we deal with every day are the lone individuals. We have not worked with any, uh, very many organized groups. In between here, uh, we've had some non-aligned terrorists for bombings. Here, the Doomsday Cult group would be, an example of that would be uh, Om Shirikyo, and of course the group that did the uh, spraying of the salad bars with the salmonella back in the 80s in Oregon. which uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this case study by now. If not, JAMA has a very good uh, write-up on the investigation of this. And I'm sure today, in the year 2000, the way our epidemiological investigation and information sharing is now, it would not take as long to figure out that this was an intentional outbreak. This is just a case was an example of being able to hand something, handle something locally as opposed to bringing in any federal assets, and that is our goal, to make everybody more uh, self-sufficient. This was someone who claimed to have a nuclear bomb in their garage, uh, but it was handled, as you see at the bottom, the local uh, state environmental protection agency and the hazmat team, they had detectors, they were able to go by and tell that it wasn't emanating anything, and therefore we weren't hit having to call any wheels up in four hours groups to come in with any uh, detection equipment to handle the case. And that's, that's what our goal is, to make everybody self-sufficient with detection and information sharing. This was another uh, case a couple of years ago where this person was uh, stopped coming in to Canada, he had several bags of ricin, and his story was that he was going to put it around his property to kill coyotes. Uh, it, we thought it was suspicious, and after he was arrested, he committed suicide, so we figured that that story wasn't true. We'll never find out why he had those bags of ricin. But luckily, because of uh, somebody's awareness, hey, he had originally said that it was a, uh, a powder just to deter people from stealing his money, and. Uh, an investigator recognized that it wasn't that and it was rice and it should be analyzed or a possibility that it would be a toxin. This person had a violent history. He shot his stepson in the face. Um, his wife consented to a search of residence because of uh, threats he had been issuing and the items found in his uh, basement were ricin, botulinum and we weaponized nicotine sulfate that when we were able to get him on possession because of the threats he had made. This uh, medical technician put Shigella on break room donuts and invited all her coworkers to come into the break room and share uh, Shigella with her. Uh, she also, uh, we found out through the investigation that she her, had poisoned her boyfriend, and while he was in the hospital, she altered his medical records so that his diagnosis would be incorrect, just for, therefore furthering his, uh, his uh, stay there in the hospital. She was prosecuted locally by state uh, prosecution, and she's in jail for 22 years. Lawrence Maltz was a very brilliant person when he was on his lithium. However, he was a manic depressive, and uh, he had made threats over 20 years, and everybody knew about him. The Secret Service knew about him. Uh, we knew about him, but he started including recipes for chemical uh, weapons in his, uh, his letters. And through USAMR SID, uh, there was a recipe that was determined to be viable, and therefore we were able to uh, put him away for uh, mailing threatening communications. That's about all we could get them for then until we changed the statutes. Ms. Schoonover was dying of cancer and was very angry at the world. So she was, uh, luckily, a observant John Q. Citizen saw her in a post office, a post, um, postal, post office and she was sitting in her van spooning white powder into little, little Ziploc zip bags that went into nutritional brochures. 
and the John Q. citizen saw the skull and crossbones on the jar that she was spooning in, and he called the police. And she had already mailed out several of them. We, uh, in the meantime, when they were trying to decide whether to prosecute her or not, she died while she was under custody. And uh, we had to do some sort of follow-up on trying to find out from public health, had you had any unusual deaths lately? You know, if, you, uh, if someone dies of cyanide poisoning, do you necessarily know if, uh, if an autopsy's not done? So that, that was a, a rather vague lead that was sent out for us to do. We talked about Larry Wayne Harris, uh, the gentleman who wrote the book on uh, protecting yourself, but also how to make a bazooka in your spare time. Uh, his, uh, his first uh, procurement was the vials of bubonic plague from uh, the American Type Culture Association. Uh, all we got him on was a fraud by wire for having a falsified letterhead and saying that he was a researcher to acquire the, um, the uh, pestis. Uh, after that, uh, over here from an informant stated that he was indicating he had possession of weapons grade anthrax. However, it turned out to be the vaccine. But uh, this was what was found in the evidence recovered on that second incident, what he had in his house. He also was a known member of a white supremacist group, uh, which makes us rather suspicious on why he was uh, working with this as opposed to writing a book on how to protect the American public. The trends still continue to be multiple mailings. We've had, since January this year, we've had over 40 uh, multiple mailings of anthrax letter, mostly to women's clinics. Uh, a few other, other places that got them last year were government agencies and news agencies, some churches. This is one of our problems. All this information on how to uh, uh, make and disseminate uh, these agents are on the internet. There is a law right now on uh, that you cannot show how to make a weapon for use as a weapon. So right now we're looking into the copyright in the beginning when they have their disclaimer that we're uh, in the books like, for instance, uh, Uncle Fester's book, he has a disclaimer that says that I don't intend this to be used as a weapon, this is just for educational purposes. I, I don't know if he's, he's gotten a lot of uh, press lately. He's up in Milwaukee. He has several books, how to make methamphetamine, how to make uh, ricin, uh, how to make uh, uh, bombs. This is our most asked question. What are the amounts of hoaxes that we're getting per year and how they've increased? As you can see in 97, biological was 22. 1998, it went up to 112. 1999, it went to 185. Going back to the chemical, it stayed consistent, 20, 23, 24. Radio nu nuclear, radiological nuclear has uh, decreased. And then we've had what we call combos <laughs> with a chemical biological threat. And they've kind of uh, jumped in the year of 1999. The interest in weapons of mass destruction continues. Uh, the threat of hoaxes and blackmail uh, is, and most of all, dis disruption is high. However, we still believe that explosive shootings and kidnappings will continue to be the most likely option because it's, it's more dramatic. You can, uh, it's easier to kill more people with an explosive than you are with uh, the reasons for what uh, Major Corpeter said that the, the problems with uh, coming up with a biological on your own without hurting yourself. And there was a few things I wanted to ask, uh, mentioned before uh, the questions, is that we are working with CDC and DOD on guidelines that will be issued to public health on law enforcement and public health working together on an epidemiological investigation. For instance, if there was a suspicious outbreak and it was found that it was intentional, we could probably work together without, without getting in each other's way, according to the guidelines, on 
finding out who the perpetrator is while you continue to do your epidemiological investigation. Um, that's it. Do I have any questions? <laughs>